So I'd like to introduce to Austin College, uh, a very large college, the largest in Quebec. We have 11,000 students, six floors here. This is a heritage building that we bought from the uh, Congregation Notre Dame. They're, they all own another building next door. There's only 13 nuns left, I think. Um, they had a lot of real estate and they were very nice to sell that to us. We had many satellite campuses and then we were allowed to put on this addition here uh, about 20 years ago. So it's a beautiful site in, in downtown Montreal, large trees that are over 100 years old that the nuns planted and, and kept. Uh, they had wonderful gardens at the time that don't exist anymore. And we have another four floors under the ground and that's where our gyms are. Um, we have to cool this building. The board decided that it should be closed. You cannot open any windows. Um, so it is air conditioned in the summer and it, of course it's heated in the winter. Tremendous ecological footprint. We had an economics class calculate that the amount of CO2 or equivalents that, are, that we produce by using electricity and gas and, and putting our waste to the landfill fills the entire building up and down, underground and above, two times. And that's what we vent into the atmosphere. And sometimes I wish that greenhouse gases were purple. And uh, on my walk from the restaurant to here, we would see this and we start to think, oh my God, what's happening? But this invisible gas is, is causing some huge problems. Uh, but we don't see it. But we had students help with that. Um, we know that we still purchase about 60 to 65 tons of paper. I don't really know what that means, but when the students looked at that and put all, measured the sheets, and they told us how much of a line that is into Ontario and towards Toronto, it, oh my God, that's a lot of photocopy. You could walk there higher than the CN Tower if you piled up your 500 sheets at a time. That made sense. So again, we realized we'd need to translate some of these terms that we use to make them real and make them visual. And that in itself was a project. Um, you see these wonderful trees, you do, do not see any greenery on the rooftops. So that's something we looked at on the walls. So we wanted to say, is this in fact a living school? We know 11,000 students come and go, but it could be one of the loneliest places. In fact, many areas that have the most people are. Schools, shopping malls, a lot of people. But why are there, why is your child, for example, or mine there eating lunch alone with 11,000 people and 1,000 staff? So, what do we do for recreation? What do we, what can we develop? Those same things those teachers told us about grade one. Does your child have an opportunity to share who he or she is at a college, in the classroom and outside? Do they make friends? Are they accepted for who they are? And again, I started to think about that. So I'm going to share with you in the next uh, half an hour, 40 minutes, what, we've, what we're attempting at Dawson. We have a lot to learn. Uh, and then perhaps have some, some questions. Or if you see something in the slide, please, if you have a question, let, let me know. So the model we're using is we want to reconnect people, community, and nature. What can we do to develop conversations? And those conversations develop relationships. And with those relationships, we have teamwork, true group leadership, we call it, to act to help solve the big issues we have. Because individuals, they're important, but we need a lot of teamwork now to solve some of these things. And that's the exciting part, and I have tremendous hope that we can do that. So I mentioned uh, today, 72 languages spoken at Dawson College. It's wonderful. Don't want to spend too much time on this slide, but I, I like to use it as a reference. And of course, it's rhetorical. Um, Canada, you and I are the largest waste producers on the planet in terms of what we send to the landfill. And that much of it is anaerobic decomposition, turns into methane, methane 25, 26 times worse than CO2. So that's a problem. So much of our material is based on plastic, and we hear about these stories in the oceans, particularly pipes that break, but we're not there. The people that are there, they, they know it. Can you imagine if there was a pipe at CBU or this building and all the animals that defecated would simply put a pipe through the wall and you'd hear it come through the pipe and we'd all run away right now and then we try to eat here. I try to use these examples and sometimes students as they get older, they all that silly. Well, really? I live on, the, on an island in the St. Lawrence River and the beluga whale puts up with those pipes all the time. When a beluga whale dies in the St. Lawrence River, it is so toxic we have to incinerate it. Because if you bury it in the, in the land that it came from, it would pollute that land. Um, and then the, the event that shocked us uh, 
whether it's a hurricane now in some of these Caribbean islands, the floods in Texas, earthquake in Mexico, what touched us in a tragic way, and it's really the backdrop of, of my talk, was this event where a, a lone gunman came into the school. And it, this was something you hear about the news that happens in the US, not in Montreal, and simply started firing. Luckily, we had two undercover, not undercover, but two police men and women, one woman and one man, in a totally unrelated drug case at the school that day. And because of them, this was stopped early, with about 20 people being shot, uh, Anastasia losing her life. So this shook us to the core. It was a tragic event. And of course, you don't want this to happen to anyone. But we had to reflect as a college, I had to reflect as a teacher with my peers and the administration, why? And what is the role of an educational institution? Why do we teach? Is it really just to get my one-on-one -on -one students to 201? So they can make it to 301? And they're lonely and they don't have friends and they can't share who they are? Not for me. Um, so although I was on this path of trying to change a school, this gave us a reason. And we stumbled upon something, our director general, who was just, I don't know what to say other than a leadership role where he was human and the media in his face, oh, what are you gonna do? You gonna have the metal detectors? And he was just saying, who knows what to do? And I remember my mom who was in her 80s at the time said, that's a man with a big heart. There's a director general. And we steered the media away from us. And we started to think and he said, I want my school back. This wasn't our fault. And he told, when the, when the premium came and said, what can I do? He said, clean this up as quickly as you can. And that phrase, take your school back, because of research, qualitative and quantitative research that I, we need, but there was a lot of research done uh, by universities, particularly McGill. Uh, they wanted to study post-shooting what happens. And what they found, uh, very interesting, the closer you were to the trauma, the longer it took to heal. But what we did was absolutely right, to get back into your school and get back to normal life. We want to go back to what we knew. And we don't want to worry about it being our, our fault. But we do need, as an educational institution, to understand what can we do. We, started a, we had a two-day conference on violence. Um, there was a psychologist from the U.S. military who talked, and I'll never forget his talk particularly about videos, having two young boys who play video games. And he was saying a lot of these uh, young men, I still don't know of one woman shooter, uh, isolated, lonely, um, quite a few of them have been playing video games, Columbine for sure. And so the question came that we often ask as parents, do these violent games where you're shooting people and getting points for it create violent people? And he said no. They've studied this a lot in the military. He did admit they use the very same games our children play to desensitize. He said, an 18-year-old boy who comes into the military does not want to shoot somebody in the head. Um, but he said that fight or flight hormones that are released when, when people are, are playing these games, you're excited. It, it's, these are my words now. He had far better words than the proper ones. But these, these centers of caring and empathy are not the most important ones. It's fight or flight. And he said, that's not good. So someone who might be thinking of something, all of a sudden there's a, a part of the brain that's not functioning as much because they've been playing these games for such a long time. The good news is within three days of playing these games, but that's still something, three days, the brain is back to normal. So they have this data. And he said, will video games make somebody violent? No. Will they influence somebody who might be having certain thoughts, perhaps? So this is what we want to get away from. And we had a choice. Well-being for all, sustainability, sharing, accepting everyone, changing education. And we had over 1,300 students give feedback, over 350 staff. And I'm very proud to say now in our new strategic plan that we're just starting, the word sustainability, the words well-being for all sustainably are in our mission. And a core value of Dawson College. And we want to just share, one of the reasons I'm here is we want to share what it is we're trying to do and learn from others, you. 
the other educational institutions, people, mothers and fathers that do great things, but let's get back to some of the basics and become a community. And when we have that, we can have our down days, we can have our down months, and we know there's some social network that's going to support us. So when we looked at well-being for all, and Catherine was part of this too, we've, we've talked for hours, we've done the workshops together, we did talk about well-being for all in a sustainable way, not to let an individual necessarily describe, yeah, I'm feeling just fine um, because I bought more, I've consumed more, but to really look at well-being in a different way. Well-being because I share more, I volunteer more, I give up myself more, I listen more. Those are things we talk about as well. And this photo is one we're using uh, in, our, in our public relations, which is really important in our field. We need to get the, the word out and we, need, we don't have to keep using words like ecological footprint and biodiversity. I've been very humbled uh, by a lot of people saying, Chris, leave the, the words alone. Just try to get images, more photos that show some compassion. Make us want to open your brochure. Make us want to come to the talk or the class. Once you have us, worry about the words. And I, I, that's still something I'm learning. And this has worked really well. Emily was a student at Dawson. She now works with the bees full time, putting rooftop bees onto buildings. So now we teach nature study in our parking lot, where we've taken crew cut grass that was just on drugs and water, had to be watered, and lawnmowers that pollute more than cars had to cut it once a week, just ridiculous. And we let the weeds grow, but it took, it took about two years to convince people that weeds are just names of any plant that grows somewhere you don't want them to grow. So if to you crew cut grass is what you want, then everything is a weed. Any flower is a weed. And we now have sections where we haven't cut the grass for three years and students are coming and they're looking at the biodiversity in the grass full of flowers and not one purchase. The birds brought them free of charge. The wind brought them free of charge. And here you hear crickets and in the crew cut grass you sit down and it might look nice but there aren't any crickets there. There are no butterflies there. there the clover's been cut so the bees have no business even being there. And all of a sudden people go, wow, that's, that's interesting. And we have classes there. There were just pitfall traps put in our parking lot to see what insects fall in. And the students are studying the biodiversity in a little island that's no bigger from the whiteboard to here. But we have many of them now on campus. We uh, raise and tag monarch butterflies and we screen each butterfly before we let it go. We tag them with a website so if anybody finds them between us and Mexico, they can check it on the website and we know where they're going. Um, and perhaps like your example, it would be wonderful to film a grade one class and their experience when they see these painted ladies, for example, coming out or the monarchs and maintenance men with degrees in engineering or the finance department going through this. At the beginning, no, 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 that's not true. We have bugs? Why should we bring bugs? I'm quoting, why should we bring bugs into finance? Last year we took the kits and we purposely talked and made sure that we put them on the counters of all the non-faculty departments, engineering, finance, HR. And invariably what happened is someone had to take care of them. And you become attached to living things. That's another beauty about these things. To care for something alive is profound. Whether you're watering a plant or taking care of this. So then what happened is people started to talk. Oh my God, did you see how much it grew? Chrysalis was beautiful and cameras on Facebook, conversations. I think, Catherine, can you remember? I'm not sure if I did this just before or after we had our focus group at Dawson. But here's another study. I think there were about 12 teachers and we felt they had over 1,200 conversations that were triggered by keeping a butterfly for 21 days from egg to chrysalis. The psychologist said they were the best three weeks of her entire career at Dawson. Yeah. Psychologist that deals with the worst of the human condition every day. And then she said students were coming back with problems, with a smile, wondering what were happening to the butterflies. So where are the posters of the forest, the relaxing forest, the counseling offices, or classrooms? And where are the butterflies on the counters of our maintenance department? And what I like to, and I really do want to write about it, one of the, one of the um, managers who made one of the comments about having bugs in the area, and that's of course a defense mechanism. They don't, they don't know how to react. And he said, can you come into my office, Chris? 
kind of leans over, makes sure no one's watching. One of the caterpillars looks kind of skinny, I'm concerned. <laughs> and I thought, there it is. You see, there it is. He doesn't have to read a paper on why the maintenance department needs to integrate more sustainability. Then another director, who I had a lot of trouble with, called me in as well. And I started to give my normal pitch. Ecological footprint, you know, we're carbon neutral, you have a big role to play in IT. And he said, yeah, Chris, uh, I really don't have time for that sustainability stuff. But he said, what's happening over there in administration when the whole team comes up, comes outside and lets the butterflies go? I want that. I just had to change my PR, right? my marketing. And these are the murals made in Mexico. We have partners now in Mexico. Uh, someone who did graffiti was honored to be asked to start working on these wonderful murals. Unfortunately, these were damaged. I'm not even sure if they're still up after uh, the earthquake. And we're dealing with our friends in Mexico now. Uh, one school damage, another one, uh, a good part of it has to be torn down so that a lot of the students have lost their experiments. It's uh, what is personal, it just means it means a lot more. So we're going to try to help them out as well. The Cecropia moth now breeds in our peace garden, largest moth in Canada. So imagine if I had a butterfly right here and I said we'd like to tag it. And I just stood here and you'd have to start to brainstorm. Uh, how, do you take the zipper off? Will it fly away? If it does, how do you catch it? These are real, real living examples of learning. How do you pick it up? Someone says, oh, I, th I think the wings are alive. If you get the color on your wings, that means it's really bad. How what if we damage it and it can't fly to Mexico? How do you put the tag on? Can it fly with the tag? And then we start. People get onto their cell phones. Oh, the wings don't have any feeling. They pump them up, and once they pump them up, that's, that's it. It's like your hair. Oh, so we're not hurting them by picking them up. No. The color is important, but it has nothing to do with keeping them alive in the, in the uh, short term. And we let it go. And then the questions start again. How did, how did they know where Mexico is? You know, there was just a study that not only do they go to the same mountaintop that their great-great-grandparents came from, in some cases the same tree on the mountaintop, that specific. The brain of that creature, beautiful creature, is the size of a pinhead. And look at the problems we've created. Just a lot to learn. Nature is mentor. So we have many projects. I'm going to sh show you more photos of these. We have honeybees on the roof. Um, we have sustainable happiness certificate. We have meditation uh, almost daily. We are announced carbon neutral forever, although we still have to sequester. We have to plant trees to take in the carbon that we produce. We've reduced our carbon footprint by 50% in six years. Um, that, that will go down even more, and we have students involved in doing all the calculations. We have a goodwill project we're talking to uh, HR about, where, where hopefully our employees can take paid time to volunteer, not their volunteer time, not their lunch, and they rush through it, wolf down the lunch, and, and volunteer for 45 minutes. But why can't a technician in mechanical engineering volunteer one hour a week and help us with the butterflies that are enriching so many students? And why can't somebody in the nursing department help with the carbon neutral program? So there are union issues. And the Director General has already mentioned to me when Living Campus and Wellbeing for All starts hitting our collective agreement, you know you're really doing something. <laughs> uh, it won't be easy, but that's where some of these rights against responsibilities are very interesting discussions. So all of these then collectively add to our well-being. This is uh, the Peace Garden that was created after the shooting where we had to we wanted to do something and we really didn't know what. Uh, Polytechnic uh, and others actually have told us, you guys got it right. We created a, a really a small park rather than a peace garden. The students made it bigger and bigger and they were wonderful ambassadors. We raised the money for this. Um, a class decided to raise $100,000 and had no idea really how, but we figured if we made the announcement, everybody would go, how are you gonna do that? And then we had attention and with attention companies are interested. So it was really fascinating. And I think of that too when I see these lists, real life. Just start with a bold question. And then you've got 30 students in front of you with cell phones, with uncles and aunts and parents who like nothing better than to hear them on the phone saying, I'm in this class, I can't believe it. This we're gonna, how, how can Uncle Bob help us? And the next thing you know, we had lawyers on the blackboard, we had names of accountants, we had people who could help us fundraise. And it took us two years, two classes. And we, because we said we were going to raise the money in one day. And that became a huge media event. And the media did come. 
and one class of about 32 students raised $49,000 that day. And then the next class said, we're going to finish it for you. And we had $101,000. That's a big bake sale. <laughs> and there's the result. 1,500 volunteers to date, uh, tourists now coming. It's named, it's designated a monarch sanctuary, a biodiversity zone in Montreal. Uh, really proud of what the students and faculty have done. And it brought us together. Yeah, a garden is a peaceful place. As I said to today earlier, sometimes it needs help to grow, other times it wants to be left alone. And that's what we needed as an institution after the tragic event. Some of us just wanted to be alone, others needed to be with other people got our hands in the ground. Uh, this summer, we estimate there were 20,000 flowers blooming on this site. The rocks were all hand-picked by the uh, contractor from a local quarry. They have uh, fossils in them. They're from Quebec, so that the geological integrity of the area is maintained. That was part of peace as well. So it wasn't just peace for people, but peace across species. What land do we have? We had the land blessed by an uh, Algonquin chief. Um, you had to make a ceremonial fire, that was against the law in Westmount, where we're from. And the fire department actually volunteered one person to come. We dug a hole, we made our fire, and we had our ceremony, and the women sprinkled tobacco on this section here. So this is called the Chief's section. We have Anastasia's garden, she loved pink. And we have an eco zone here. All of the flowers that were put at our doorstep, thousands of them from around the world after the shooting, the students collected, we composted them, and we put the compost, the form of love and friendship that we received from so many people, underneath a uh, flower and almond tree that was for Anastasia. So I'll just read that, it's a little bit small. Um, naturalized areas have an impact on people's mental state, mood, and sense of security, which contributes to sociability. So we borrow from positive psychology. Now I can speak of this having gone back to school um, and studied and still studying more. But what I asked those teachers so many years ago, more than 20, 25 years ago, about sharing and love and acceptance, caring, positive psychology. If we have activities where we can share positive emotions, sense of engagement, and we're talking living schools, we can develop positive relationships. There's a sense of meaning. Why am I doing this? Why am I digging a hole? Planting. Sense of accomplishment. We start to build community. We have relationships with trust. In leadership, we have an expression. No trust, no beginning. If you don't have that, then it's really hard to develop any, anything else in terms of a project. And by trust, very generally, I don't want to get into all kinds of trust theory, but the notion that I can stand here as a leader or a teacher or as a, as a parent and ensure that if there's an issue of fairness, I will come in and help you. It's so important. So if we allow heckling of any type, or the ribbing, the laughing at someone else's expense, forget the living school activities. That's, that's the beginning. And once you have that, though, things can really start to go. So in leadership, that's something we spend a lot of time on, to develop and maintain the group and have norms, and then we can build on that afterwards. And uh, Dalton asked here, he's sitting in, on the stump, he sat there for two and a half hours. I think that's the uh, least I've seen him move in his entire life as a student. He was much like I was at his age, uh, had trouble, and um, he was a rapper. And um, he asked if he could do a rap as part of his final exam. And my students can express themselves any way they can, as long as it's done appropriately, we agree on that and they can help me understand how they're expressing themselves so I can meet the objective, or in our case, competencies of the, the education. Uh, and he wanted to write a rap about climate change. And it was incredible. And if you remind me, I'll send you, I'll, I'll send uh, a copy. He brought the house down, 100 people just stood up, his peers just wouldn't stop clapping. Um, he had never received that type of attention because of something that he wrote and, and he performed. And he was asked to perform that on radio. He was asked to perform that in Mexico. Um, and that's because someone like us just said, yeah, write a rap about climate change. And it meant something to all those students far more than what I could have done, or what I did standing in front of a class with a, the equivalent of a weather map for an hour and a half. So the arts are just so important. This is the group, uh, also an exchange group we had that made an insect hotel. This is a habitat for pollinators. I saw that you've got them at CBU as well. 
And this is the, actually the roof of our gym. And uh, we've transformed that into a biodiversity zone with a pond, a wet meadow, a field now. And uh, the biology teacher that you see here, Chase, was saying this was a transformative moment where we put a bumblebee nest and drilled holes for mason bees and there's spiders in here, um, a small wren box. And he said, in my lab, I kill insects all the time to teach my students the orders. I never thought of giving back to insects. And he said, this has been incredible. And he does that now. He talks about how important it is to learn how to, to know the orders of insects. So they have their traps, they go into the alcohol and they die. But now he's ensuring that part of what he does is something that benefits insects. So we just opened our second franchise, uh, the Bug and Breakfast, on the other side of the gym. And uh, that's going strong. But it's these types of moments and these types of comments. You can imagine the expressions here on these teachers. These are consultants and teachers, psychologists, are no different than a grade one class that has butterflies or have their hands in the garden. This is human, this is being human. And that's a living, I know you're shaking your head, you've seen it. So it doesn't matter about the age. And isn't it wonderful when we start to lose the titles of who those people are? They just feel good because we're transforming the roof of a gym. And there's less of an uh, air conditioning load now, we're saving energy, the insects are happy, they fly across to the other side and pollinate our vegetables that are given to a food shelter. And those connections are just there and lived. And they feel good and they want to come back to school. Less absenteeism. One of my courses uh, that I was teaching, embarrassingly had to be split in half when we were reviewed by the government. I still remember they said, whose course is this one here? Because you're putting in an awful lot of work and you can't do that, it's not fair. Uh, of course, I'm looking around to my peers, gotta be one of you guys, and it was my class. And they were doing f way over 100 hours of homework when the ponderation of homework time was 45. So the class is now split. Um, they wanted to do the work. I'm just gonna check how I'm doing on time here. Okay. So again, the expressions here, working near windows, research clearly shows just having daylight and, and seeing a tree on the outside of a window makes a difference. You can see the expressions of people here out in their gardens. I think every photo other than the one in, on the upper left, this is on a rooftop. This is rooftop and this is now a rooftop. We have picnic tables, they can come out and eat. They can be beside the, the pollinators, the bees, and they start conversations. And those conversations lead to relationships. And those relationships go a long way to making people feel they belong. And sometimes I hesitate as I am now, maybe, just maybe, someone who has a weird idea one day, instead of picking up a gun, will pick up a phone, or say, what are you doing tonight? Or say, you know what, I want to go back to school tomorrow. What's the big deal when a bug or a bird visits a landscape? What I try to say is when a Baltimore or a Northern Oriole comes to eat an orange that we put out, and it thinks it's now found an orange tree in Quebec, which is kind of neat. <laughs> it's stunning. It's made it from Central America. It's made it through the windows. It's made it through the cats. It's made it through the pollution. It's made it through the cut forests. And it came to Dawson College. And then you, see, you just hear silence in the room. Good for you. We gave it a safe place. It found nesting material. It found enough to feed its young. And hopefully it will get back to where it wants to go. And that's because of the works that students and teachers have done. That's big. And we do the same thing with a dragonfly. Or a mushroom. It becomes a big deal. And for the bird it absolutely is. Because I often ask my students, if you're a robin and you go to Mexico, which they do, all the robins are gone. Why do you come back? To me there's a, a complete connection between helping the bird and taking the time to reflect about what got it here and its needs, well-being for all, and these expressions. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen students and teachers hugging because they felt they've helped something. That little mason bee is in the... I, I, did, I made that. I made that a month ago. Look, look, look at this. It's amazing. But it needs flowers. Where, where are the flowers? Just... It never ends for me. That just fills my heart. And I want to go back to work. And one of the things I've really worked on very hard, I was talking to Catherine about this today, is I feel really gratified that I cannot make a big distinction between my hobbies and my work. 
And even my friends will say, yeah, wait, that, that's not right, because that's not right. You have, you have to make a distinction. That's a very stereotypical answer, isn't it? So if you're glad that your work day's over and you go home, I ask you, why do you, why do you want to go home? Make that list in part of a sustainable happiness certificate. What is it about home that you like and why don't you have it at work? And I've worked on this for 10 years, this, this project. So there's no difference for me in my hobbies right now and my work. And there are things, of course, that are different, but I don't have that big, that big line. And maybe there's something wrong with that too. Do children leave their community to go to school? And they get on the bus and go back to their community? I have a big problem with that. Why aren't they excited about getting on the bus and going to a community and feeling sad when they leave that community? Or maybe it's the same community. So just that, too, is something to think about. This is a decomposition zone. We just put a beautiful big log, a hundred-year-old log, on our rooftop and cut it in half, and we're putting hinges on it with a lock. And we're going to be studying how this beautiful dead tree, a nurse log, as we talked about, is going to give so much life to other things, and students will be studying that. We have a little pond on the left there with insects in it. We're letting trees grow in soil that's no deeper than perhaps four or five inches. That too is the roof of our gym now. I put the signs up two years before anything was ready because I was getting, no, you can't do that, no, you can't do that. <laughs> Weight load issues, who wants mosquitoes on the property, Zika. I mean, it just went on. So we made the signs, sort of get people ready, what's happening, and there was some excitement. Then one of the psychologists called it Dawson's Biodome, and that kind of caught fire, it's kind of neat. And here we are two years later, and it's staying. Japan is the first country where uh, they can write prescriptions and uh, they can prescribe a 20 minute walk in nature for employees. And they've done an awful lot of research using MRIs and what happens to the brain with scenes like this that we can supply in school yards, put on our rooftops, have photos of at least indoors if we have to or underground, and it makes a difference. Um, I believe we have a genetic affinity to nature, whether we realize it or not, um, and we need that. Isn't it interesting if you show a spider or a snake to some people who are born in the city, have never seen them before, they recoil, yet you show them a gun and we know what guns do, it's just a gun. They haven't been around long enough, I'm, I'm convinced that's, that's genetic. Hundreds of thousands of generations, if you were afraid of snakes and spiders, your chance of survival were increased. Uh, but there's got to be a reason that it's that visceral. And there's other examples in us that scientists are starting to look at. Maybe there's more of a genetic connection than we even realize. This was inspired by a CBU, a living wall we have now, in a room that was designed specifically uh, using a nature as mentor theme, and it is for teachers to come and imagine and create. So it's got nice round furniture, split levels, we try to get away from the squareness of the room as a mezzanine, and what we've realized is by re-landscaping, we're looking at some of the research that we can change behavior, there's less anxiety, uh, a large portion of our college population has anxiety problems. Um, if we can bring that down a little bit, just think of what that does for student success. So we're looking carefully at how nature can influence that. We know it cultivates relationships, incubates hope, and supports sustainable and healthy living. So we've got gardens. This is another rooftop where we have vegetable gardens. And again, I want to mention relationships. You can just see the expression on the girls there. It's not just the garden. It's not just the people, it's not just the teacher, it's not just the sunny day like we had today in Cape Breton. All of it becomes an earth value, and it gets back to the big package rather than isolating each one of those things. Exposure to nature makes people feel good, increases happiness, well-being, and it's interesting when you feel good, you volunteer more, you want to help more. And that's something we're going to start to look at and hopefully do some research on as well. And that's in a very simplistic form. But a big part of that, again, is relationships. It's not just the butterfly or the garden, it's the people that are there and how they're interacting with each other and feeling good about what they're doing. And the power of cell phones for youth right now, although they're, we tend to say in the classroom they can be a pain, uh, to get the information we're teaching to students out on Facebook within 20, well, never mind 24 hours, within hours, uh, this generation can spread information and teach much more than we can standing in the classroom. I refused to go on Facebook for many years, and it was this class that was fundraising when a student said, Chris, if you're going to, if you're going to email me, text me and tell me. And I thought, you're going to be kidding me. 
But then, you know, then I looked at the reaction, and no, no, I mean, email was passé. And I said, get onto Facebook, you'll get me right away. And I said, no, no, no. And I, I, I couldn't tell you why, it was just, I was older and it wasn't for me. And uh, so I challenged them. We were trying to get a peace message from every country in the world. And I said, if you guys can get me a, a message from the Antarctic on Facebook within a week, I'll get on Facebook. Next class, because we had the class once a week. I said, then I'm in. Well, of course, a, a small, but there was a lineup of students when I got to work that morning, 12 hours later, because they got onto Facebook, a good portion of the class, and just said, hey, anybody know somebody? And we got a message from a wonderful man from London, England, who was doing research in the Antarctic, and he said, great project, guys. Here's my message. Keep it up. And I've been on Facebook ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the challenge. We need to connect wonder and awe and information, sciences and the arts, knowing and feeling, school and community coming together. Not an easy task to do, but this is, goes a long, long way to doing that. And these are some of the activities that you've seen. The 1249 Club is 1,249 kilometers of 12 bees travel to make one teaspoon of honey. So where the bees are, we challenge uh, faculty and, and students to get together and form teams. And on the website, they can actually log all their exercise and we challenge them to travel and exercise as many kilometers as 12 female bees do to make a teaspoon of honey. And if you can do that, we give you a teaspoon of the awesome peace garden. So we're creating biodiversity zones, very small ones everywhere, and that's been really good as well. Uh, we are carbon neutral, um, and I purposely put this slide in because it, it's dated. We brought that way down. Uh, the number of tons we produce has been cut in half from 900 to 400 tons of, of greenhouse gases. We are still planting trees, and we're integrating um, uh, the North-South program. Hopefully, we'll have some students that actually plant the trees that are growing in marginal land and bringing the economy back to a, to a small town in Nicaragua uh, because of the work that we do. We also collected eyeglasses, something you've probably heard about, and we gave over 2,000 eyeglasses that had the prescription on them, and there was a lineup for blocks, and everybody in the town received prescription glasses. That's something so simple to do. So from that at the beginning to gardens that celebrate diversity and growth and life and recycle locally. They're a live storehouse of information, a library, inspiration for artists. And we're dealing with a population in our institutes of higher education that want to help more than any other population survey to date. So that the, the main message I would leave, as Whitehead said in 1929, a university is imaginative or, or it is nothing. And sometimes we get guilty of status quo because it's comfortable. Uh, change sometimes is not a comfortable place, but that's uh, something somebody wrote on my kitchen wall. I had to paint it, so I said, go for it. And I could never paint it. The whole wall is my beautiful wall now with the inspirational quotes. And uh, I think it begins there. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you.